this talk is going to be on uh, graphs. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Have you ever heard of graphs before? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, grab is uh, an open source flat file CMS. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about why I created it and um, why it's good and why you should use it uh, potentially over other platforms. And then um, I think we'll have time to go, go a little bit more of a deep dive onto uh, creating a theme real quick. I have a have a project that uh, we can sort of step through and see see the processes that are involved in doing that. Uh, there's way more to do, but you know I just want to get as much time as I can in the time. Um, so so who am I? Um, my name is Andy Miller. Um, I've uh, been around web development uh, basically since the dawn of the web. So back in a university, I was messing around with HTML back when HTML was a new specification and it just had text and hyperlinks. It was the true HTML as, as it was intended. Um, and it was very exciting. Any days when we had uh, new features added like colors and tables and GIFs and things like that. So um, I've been doing um, basically web development since that point um, in various forms. Um, I will also be co-founder of the Joomla CMS. Um, so I was a part of the whole team of Mambo when Mambo forked to become Joomla. And um, there was a lot of parallels to uh, Frank's talk that he just gave um, about starting a new community, forking a, a code base, trying to build up everything from scratch with a new name. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stories about how Joomla got its name. Uh, it was um, quite a long and involved process in that. Um, I later went on to form Rocket Theme, which is a professional theme development company focusing on open source platforms, so Joomla and WordPress primarily, but now also Graph. And um, I'm also a senior partner in a, in a company called Trilby Media, which is basically a professional services company um, for Graph. So this is basically how we fund the, the Graph development by doing professional services projects uh, for, for, for clients. And then I'm obviously the, the creator of Graph. So just a quick history of the kind of websites I used to work on. This was the first website I actually had ever built for a lot of my professors at the University of Florida. Um, and then after graduating, I went to work for Exxon. And I was a, um, a, a very new employee of Exxon in charge of the corporate Exxon.com website, as well as the corporate firewall. And that was the entire Exxon Corporation coming through one pipe in, in uh, Houston, Texas. And I was in charge of all of that. I had the keys. Um, it was a little bit overwhelming. I had a lot of security uh, discussions. Um, this is my personal website around 1997, um, sort of dabbling in web design at the same time. And this is sort of the height of 1997 web technology here. Uh, this was a project I worked on in 1997 for the George Bush Presidential Library. This was all custom active server page development at this time. Um, and then by about year 2000, I was doing uh, it was, uh, startups, and uh, this was a big startup. Uh, had a lot of VC capital, and it was a bid for real estate, so it was the eBay of real estate. Um, we built all that stuff from scratch, all in Java. Um, and then this was the Rocket Team website that I started in about 2005. Um, so, what's the point of having another CMS? We got a lot of them, right? So, the main issue that I have with, with most content management systems, and I've worked with a lot of them for a long time, is um, they're not very fast usually. They're, they're, they, they incur a lot of overhead, um, so that's why it's static file generators have become a popular option is to get back to that sort of raw performance that, that you should have for your website. And also people's um, attention span continually gets shorter and shorter. So unless you can grab them and show them all the information in the first few seconds, then they're bored and they've moved on. Um, 
obviously, content management systems get more complex uh, as you add more functionality to them, uh, to a point where they just become overwhelming to work with. Um, and the big problem I have being sort of like a designer and a developer is um, a lot of content management systems sort of require you to uh, to work with that content management system. So they have a lot of like uh, presentation logic in the core, and you have to work with that. Or, you know, you have to extend it and then constantly keep track of what you changed. And it's it's just quite complicated to uh, uh, to create a design that you've come up with on a particular platform. You may have to make some sort of sacrifices. Joomla was notoriously bad at this. Um, you know, we would get uh, designs from a web designer and they say, I want the, the, the article page to look like this. And we'd have to say, well, this entire section is coming out of Joomla. There's only so much we can do with that. It doesn't have this and that. We'll have to sort of just make it look close. So what you ended up doing in, in the Joomla world is you could in instantly tell that it was a Joomla website by looking at their content articles that had little icons across the right for PDF and print. And that's just the way it came out of Joomla. Um, of course, with CSS getting more powerful, we were able to manipulate them more, but back at the start, there wasn't much you could do. Um, also, extensibility. So obviously, most content management platforms have plugins and things like that, but they're quite limited sometimes, or you can only manipulate things in certain ways. So I wanted to make sure that the, the CMS I wrote, you could extend pretty much anything you wanted to. Um, on the topic, topic of security and updates, obviously this is a well-known problem with WordPress constantly having you know, security issues. It's, it's, it's just a, a common situation when you've got a platform where you can edit content. It means it's not that hard for someone to get in and edit for content. You know? I mean, you're providing them with, with, the, with a mechanism, you're just trying to block them. So I wanted to make sure that, that, that my solution address this in the best way so you can easily update um, you know the whole process of, of getting bugs fixed or security issues fixed was, was quick and easy. Um, so obviously extensible via plugins and I wanted to make sure that that the new system was enjoyable to work with. Um, I was really tired of working on these other platforms, WordPress and Joomla. I always felt like I was fighting against them instead of it working with me. Um, so I wanted to make sure that, the, in whatever I could, it was actually fun to use. And I enjoyed web development again, because I was sort of getting really tired of it all. And um, on the licenses front, I'm not going to get into the licenses argument, but um, Joomla was a GPL licensed CMS, as is WordPress and is Drupal. And GPL is a great open source license, except it's, I find it too restrictive in that you have to re-release stuff if, if you want to, um, if you want to make changes to it, you know, you keep it eternal, that's fine, but if you want to share those changes, that needs to be GPL too. So basically you have to have everything compatible with GPL, even things that, that you use. So I want to make sure the, the license I use was even more open. So we use the MIT license, which means it's much more flexible with other different kinds of licenses. Um, and there's really, you don't even think about it. So license is not even a question. So the one thing, the things I wanted to make sure that the new one had is it had to be fast. I wanted it to be flat file. The main reason why I wanted it to be flat file was um, one of the big headaches with a traditional CMS that has a database. And, uh, it's got a database for content and, and data, and then it's got files for presentation and configuration and things like that, perhaps. Uh, and then you've got to keep these things in sync. And if you want to store the stuff in a uh, source control repository, it's very hard to make sure you've got the right version of your files with a, a data dump of your database. And then there's all these issues with upgrades and migrating databases to make sure the structure is maintained and the backup is compatible, blah, blah, blah. Flat files, you just got the files, you zip them up, you send them to someone, they unzip it, the website is back 100% the same as, as, as you saw it. You can source control it, and it's much more flexible. And obviously, it's, um, it's, it's pretty fast for, for small sets of data. As you scale, then there are more complexities involved. But, um, I wanted it to use markdown content instead of HTML. That was just my personal choice because I really like it. Um, and it was gaining popularity around the time I was, I was starting to write this. It was being used on GitHub and other places too. 
Um, obviously, open source. I wanted to use Twig for templating, which is uh, Twig is a templating library for PHP, um, and it's pretty much the best one. Um, it's used in a lot of other projects, like Drupal 8 uses Twig, and uh, October CMS uses Twig, a ton of things use Twig. So it's kind of the de facto one. Um, everything should be extensible via plugins. I want it to be really easy to install. So basically, to install Grab, you unzip it. That's it. You just unzip it, and you point your browser at it, and it works. Um, and I wanted it to be fun to use. So, obviously, um, these are some of the, the, the core features that Grab has. So, uh, from the first day I started writing a line of code, one of the first things that I added was a debugger. Like a debug bar that I could see on my browser and showed me the performance of, of the code. So every time I would make a change or I would do something, I would always be optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. So if the, uh, I rewrote the whole logic for how the pages work probably about 15 times, just to think, just every single time I got an idea to slightly tweak it, um, I was just performance optimizing it. And even to this day, the speed is the number one thing that, that, we, that we focus on. So everything we do is, is related to speed. Um, it has a lot of modern features inside of the CMS itself, like like the SEO friendly um, thing. It's not an option, but in Joomla and the WordPress, it's an option if you want to turn on like the friendly URLs in in Grab. It's a requirement. You have to have uh, you know, rewrites on your um, web server um, or web server. Um, has a built-in package manager, so this makes it easy to install stuff and find stuff and update stuff, so um, that's, that's a built-in, um, and it has quite a few uh, plugins. I think we're up to nearly 300 plugins available, and they're all um, open source plugins. Um, we have a very active community, so this is something that I took from my experience with the Joomla core team, um, how to sort of focus on helping people. So we have, we're very, accessible. Um, you know, I actually created a project that I'm still involved in daily, answering people's GitHub questions on our, on our Discord chat, answering questions. We have a forum. Um, there's just a ton of ways to reach us. Um, and I wanted to use all the best technologies out there. So PHP, which this is written obviously, is um, uh, had a reputation for many years of being a slow, not very modern uh, scripting language, but PHP's come a long way. PHP 7 is a really solid um, uh, you know, version of PHP. It's very fast. It's, it's, it's up there now with, with all the other ones that were always claimed to be the fastest, like you know, Ruby on Rails and stuff like that. Uh, PHP is really fast now, too. Uh, it's going to get even faster. And, uh, and what has happened because of that is there's now a rich community of, of packages that, that you can use. So just like in the JavaScript world, there's, there's, no, in, there's, there's NPM and there's all of these packages available. There's a ton of stuff for PHP also. So I wasn't going to rewrite everything. I wasn't going to write it all from scratch. So I use things like uh, Doctrine for caching, uh, Symfony for some of the uh, core framework classes, Twig obviously. A, a markdown library, so I didn't have to reinvent all those things. I just had to pull them all together and um, use them in a, in a smart way. So quickly run through some of these. So just some of the, the main things: the, the flat file um, nature, the package manager has environment configurations, which is kind of like in uh, Laravel. I don't know if you've ever used that, but it's uh, it, it allows you to have a folder um, for like local host. And then you can put configuration overrides in that folder. And when you're on localhost, you'll use those. And you can set it up so that on your production machine, if you have a folder with the you know, www.mysite.com, you have configuration options in there that are specific to that environment, too. So it's really easy to handle uh, different configurations um, for different um, setups. Um, the routing and redirection, instant install, a lot of caching. Uh, configuration overrides, so I just sort of alluded to that, but um, Grab basically has this, this like override system throughout its core, 
So you have a, a main configuration file, and then you can have a, a, a user configuration file that overrides the defaults. You don't have to override everything. You just override specific ones that you want. And then you can overwrite them in um, these environment files that overwrite, you know, that kind of overrides this, this tree of, of configuration. So it lets you have a lot of a granular control. And that's the overwrite rate. Um, so one of the capabilities is that uh, for, for content specifically, is this flat file base gives you really easy version control and sort of synchronization support. So you can synchronize a database I mean, uh, sites um, for Ruby services like Dropbox if you want to, or just like rsync, things like that. Um, but also you can use version control, host hooks, and that's what we normally do for our clients, and that's kind of what we recommend, is you put your grab website into a uh, Git repo, and then every time you do a commit from your local machine, you set up a post hook that pushes it to your to your live website. So it lets you have a local development environment, and your website's always backed up, you can always restore it or roll it back, whatever you want to do. Um, it's got modular pages, which is this concept where you can create a single page from, from sub pages. This is particularly useful for one page website uh, design, which is quite popular. Um, so you just sort of think as this one page site as being built from these other pages and they're sort of pulled in to a collection and you sort of loop over them and display them. Each of those pages has their own rendering so that allows you to get the sort of complicated layouts that you, that you want to create uh, without having to pull all the content into one layout and have that one layout be controlling everything. So it's, it allows you to break the pages up which is pretty neat. Um, it has a uh, retina support for files, that's sort of built in, and that was in there at day one, so you can put like an at 2x uh, uh, JPEG on your site, and Grab automatically knows how to handle that and render that appropriately, so it's, it's going to set the right version. Um, oh, it, it'll, it'll create these the, the sub-sizes for you, so if you have an at 2x file, it'll make one half its size uh, and serve that up if you're put on a regular display. Um, custom fields, so you can make custom attributes for your pages and your content. Uh, you can use taxonomies, so you can create categories and tags and things like that and assign a content to that. Uh, you can create different collections with different criteria. And image media processing, so this is sort of used by the retina stuff, but it allows you to, on the fly, um, resize images, crop them, zoom them, uh, rotate them, all those kind of things. Uh, and it's got built-in uh, multi-language support. So this was added in about version one water grab, and it was kind of a community effort where I said, what do you guys want? I'm an American, I only speak one language. I'm not really experienced at this. Um, so tell me what features do you, you need to, you know, to make sure that the multi-language support in, in, in grab is solid. So they came up with a big list, and I just went through and just you know, created all, the, all that functionality, and that's been really, really good. Um, people really love it. That's why it's quite popular in, in uh, Europe, where the multiple language is key, and they've got to have their websites in multiple language, languages. Um, and I found this has actually been really useful for other things. I actually use the multiple language support in our documentation to represent versions. So I just have two languages of versions, you know, uh, 1.5 and 1.6. Those are treated as, as languages inside the graph, and that means that by documentation, I only have to translate bits that are relevant to each language. It's, it's pretty cool. So some of the theming features we have. Um, we have um, theme inheritance, so that's sort of like the ability to take another theme and say, I want to inherit from that, so you just have to override the stuff you want to modify. So that's quite nice if you are developing a theme that's very much like another theme, you want to be able to keep it updated, but maybe not have to change everything. You just want to change some colors or a logo or something like that. Um, but that's you know that's an option. Um, the asset manager is uh, a nice way to add CSS and JavaScript to your uh, to your output, and then you can control that. So you can say, I want the JavaScript to be pipeline, so it'll basically compress it and uh, you know minify all that. Whole all those assets and then um, serve them as one file rather than being a multiple file. Um, so it's got a lot of capabilities now. You can, you can defer 
uh, asset loading and things like that. Um, so it's got, it's got Twig templates, and Beams even had access to plugin events. So you could actually do a lot of logic that you would traditionally have to do in a plugin. You could do it just from your theme. So if you're developing a theme for a client, and they need to have like a few extra sort of capabilities, you could just actually stick it in the theme rather than saying, okay, I need a theme and a plugin, um, which is quite handy. Um, so the plugins, obviously, we focus on, on optimizing uh, for performance there. And uh, plugins are usually pretty small uh, for Grab. There's not a whole lot of from, uh, sort of setup code that you need. You just sort of tack on to these events. So if you say that I'm listening to these events, and then in those event functions, you, you just put your, your code. So you'll find that most Grab plugins are very small, especially compared to WordPress. Um, and as a consequence of that, they're actually quite simple to write. Uh, I always tell people who try to do all this stuff in Twig, they try to do a bunch of logic in Twig, I'm like, just write a plugin. It's, it's really easy to do. And especially as we have a generator CLI tool, you can just say dev tools, new plugin, it, it will dump out all the stuff you need to get a plugin uh, functional. And with inside of Grab, you don't even have to register a plugin. You just put the plugin in the plugins folder, and as long as it's got the requirements, that plugin is just going to work. Um, so that makes the development of a, of a plugin really easy to do. So to get up and running with Grab, it's not really that involved. Um, just can go to the Get Grab website um, and uh, download a zip file. Um, you extract it into your web root, and then you point your browser at it. So that's it. Um, to show this, how even easier this is, um, it'll even run with the uh, built-in PHP web server. I don't know if you guys know this, but PHP has a built-in web server, so you don't even need to install a web server, Apache or Nginx or anything like that. So uh, what I want to do, now I can't see that. <laughs> let me let me mirror. it with some just a one page of, of, of a home page and then a page of some software typography. Uh, but that's that's the base install of Grab. It doesn't come with an, like, a, like a GUI admin by default. That's the, that, that's a plugin you can install. Um, it just I'm kind of looking here and I'll kind of go into a little bit about the, the full structure but um, so um, the folder structure is quite uh, standard, so all of Grab stuff is inside of this like system folder here. That's that's all of the logic for Grab, and everything that a user does is in this user folder. So you can put the user folder in source control, and that contains everything. It's going to have your content, your configuration, your themes, your plugins, any um, like data that you create and uh, generate or report that you need. That all sits under the uh, user folder. Everything else is is uh, sort of either uh, the system or it's like a temporary caching type, type setup. Um, and the vendor folder, um, a composer-based vendor, 
uh, requirements. So this can be reinstalled. So that's it. And you can also install from uh, Composer. So you can just do Composer uh, create dash project. And you use the git grab slash grab, which is the GitHub repo, and then a directory. So I can install it directly using Composer. Uh, this is going to go and grab the repo, and then it's going to run um, the install script. A lot of these um, uh, uh, vendor files are actually for testing, so at the end they're, they're removed. So you can kind of see this, because it installs everything. Uh, and then it's cloning in four things. So it's cloning in the problems plugin, which helps address any like, server setup issues it sees, um, a couple of other plugins, and then the bark is the theme, the default theme. So that one installed a different way. But it was just a one liner. And then I can point there. Now, just to show you that this will actually run um, with the PHP web server, I can do uh, PHP s localhost. I give it a port, and then I have to point it to the system router. So that's a PHP file that tells it how to route. Uh, and that basically means I can go to up here to a localhost 8000. See, it's actually responding with, with um, you know, all the files and assets you use. And this is this is a fully functional um, graph site, and everything will run fine with that. Um, so for development, it's super easy. You don't even need to set up a web server, and a lot of people use this. Okay. So. Um, so that's a quick demo there. Again, it's getting grab up. So, so just to run through the folder structure, uh, the assets folder is where any generated um, uh, or compiled uh, CSS assets would, would go. So this is if you turn on pipelining. So pipelining in the asset manager is basically taking you know, bootstrap.css and your custom theme.css and any other CSS files minifying those together, compressing them, and storing the output of that into this assets folder. And that is then served rather than those individual files. So uh, this isn't such a big deal these days with HTTP2, but prior to this, the number of assets you had really impacted your performance of your websites because every single one of those had to be, be retrieved and it was quite slow if they didn't use a shared connection. But with HTTP2, uh, a connection is maintained, so uh, it's much more efficient than um, the bin folder contains the CLI commands to grab. Um, things like um, clearing the cache you can do from the CLI, you can create projects from the CLI. Um, in fact, I can just sort of jump real quick and uh, have that. But I can say bin grab, and these are the available commands. Um, so this is kind of like in Drupal, they have Drush. Dr uh, CLI thing. Um, so you can, do, you can do log viewer, you can do logs, sandboxes again, the same stuff. There's a scheduler inside of Grab, so it's kind of a new feature. Um, so you can hook into uh, your uh, cron and you can set up jobs inside of Grab to do periodic uh, Grab related tasks and it just uses a, a single line in cron where cron sort of runs and checks to see if there's any jobs pending. Um, there's a YAML. Linter, which will look at configuration policy if you have any interest inside of that. Uh, and there's also a game with the GPM, which I'll get to later, which is the package manager. So here you can see um, you can do stuff with packages, install plugins and themes, upgrade, those kind of things. And then there's stuff for uh, plugins. So you can write a plugin that provides CLI commands, and it's really uh, quite a simple thing. You can uh, have any sort of one error. Um, so that has a couple of CLI commands that you can So uh, there's a lot of CLI stuff you can do. Um, oh, skip through these. So the, the cache folder is obviously where cache files go. This folder is where any processed um, media stuff goes. So if you resize, uh, like a, a JPEG 
egg or something, we put the crop in, that, that crop version will go here. It's sort of temporary um, until you clear out that particular patch. Uh, the system folder is where obviously all the core ram goes, and the music folder is where the root stuff goes, and then there is the where the vendor goes. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of obvious. So the most important folder is the user folder. This is what most people have to deal with. So we have accounts folder. This is where you can create user accounts. Um, we have a couple of approaches on, on how to do that. Then there's a data folder where um, anything you need to store, maybe some form submissions um, or some other kind of data that sits outside of traditional content, it could be stored in there. The page folder is where your main sort of pages go. This is what actually builds your website. You know, this is like the home page, the blogs, all these kind of things. Uh, logins and the themes, um, they all sit there. And um, of course you have your own folder structure. Um, so, inside of the page folder, we traditionally have a bunch of other folders. And for example, you may have one with O1 home, and this, this is not required, this is kind of the standard. So this is where your home page would go, and the O1 is a, is a numerical prefix that, like it does a couple of things inside a graph. It means that one, it should probably be in the menu, so it's considered visible. Um, and because it's one, it should come first. So if you create another folder called go to blog in the menu, that would be after home. It kind of makes sense. So it's a way to order something in the in the file system without having to set or go order new things. A lot of things you can actually override in the content themselves, but there are some like defaults. So the default thing is if it has a numerical prefix, it's in the menu and, and it's visible uh, in the menu and it's in the order of that, that, that you prefix. If you don't have a prefix, like if I just have like a contact us, uh, that won't be in the menu by default. Uh, and it doesn't need a prefix if it's not the menu it doesn't the order. And then inside of that folder is at least a markdown file. And so for example, default.nd, uh, that file contains the content for the page. And the fact that it's called default means that in the theme, um, the uh, core is going to look for a, for a rendering file called default.html.twig and it's .html by, uh, because we didn't provide a prefix in the URL. So if you went to a URL that was uh, blog slash atom.rss, it's actually going to look for an RSS twig template to render. Now, Lucky you don't write that every time because there's a plugin that will magically do it for you. But that basically gives you full control over what you're rendering and how you render it because you can control um, what the output renderer is based on the extension of the, of, the, of the URL. Obviously, if you don't provide an extension, it's going to default to HTML. Um, so that's what those things are. It allows you to do Ajax uh, stuff really easily because you can, you can have uh, JSON. Responses. So you can have a default.html.twig and sitting also with it, default.json.twig, and that's like JSON encoding your data and sending it back as a JSON. Super easy to do. Right? Um, so inside of this folder, you can also put all, 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 the, all the media associated with so, so things that like images and videos and things. And if you have uh, multi language, you can have multiple language versions of your file in that same folder. So default.fr.md. Going to be a French version of your page, and if if, uh, if you don't have the, def the default.fr.nd and you're in French mode, it will fall back to default.nd. You can actually configure your, your 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 language lineup so it can fall back to English if that's available, and if that's not available, then to Dutch, and then if that's not available, then to the default file if that's available. So it can kind of fall back. So just to cover open, just to recover the numeric prefixes of upper order visibility and the folder name defaults to the route. So what that means is if the folder is called o1.home, then you can reach that by going to your website slash home. Uh, if inside of o1.home you have um, you know, a folder called blah, then you can reach that by going to home slash blah. So the folder name in the file system dictates the slug structure of the URL, and you can override that. So, so the folder structure is the actual? It's 
the taxonomy, it's the, it's the navigational architecture. No, no, it's the navigational architecture. Yeah. 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 So, um, but you can override it. So, for example, if you wanted your URL to be different in, in French, you could set the slug in the French uh, content file to be something else. The grab will pick that up. So it allows you to completely control the uh, you know, your URL structure and the navigation just through folders. So, silly question, how, how do you link in the page from one page to another? Um, you, just, um, you just use the, the slugs. Um, and um, Grab has some like logic to look in the markdown and um, calculate where you are. And um, there's a whole section in the documentation. You can, you can even use you know, relative links. So you can use dot dot slash something else. You can go up one and then go down one. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. You can actually use the full path too, like with the o one dot home and all that stuff. It will strip that out and calculate what the slugs are. Like that. So I think if you make that like a block size, every block goes. Um, so there's a lot of things inside of Grab that are just our defaults. So for example, like the visibility, that's a default and you can change it by overriding in the front matter of the page, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and the markdown file traditionally will contain markdown for the content, but you can also put twig in there if you enable twig uh, in the front matter, so you can actually have logic inside of your content. Uh, you can use short codes as a plugin um, called shortcode core. That provides a bunch of standard shortcodes. You can write your own plugins that extend shortcode core. Um, a lot of people do that. And you can put HTML into your content too. So it's really, really flexible. So this is a sample of a really basic page. And this, um, this top piece is what we call the front matter. And this is very similar to you know, Jekyll and other platforms if you ever use them. So it uses YAML syntax, which is basically a key value sort of structure, but you can have nested um, objects in there. Um, so I'm actually setting a title called home, which if I hadn't have set that, it would have used the default of the folder name. So it still would have been called home, um, but I'm just expressly setting it to home. Um, and I'm setting a custom variable, which is not inside of Grab, just called header home. And I can use that later on um, by pulling it out of the header and by using that. That variable that I set. And then uh, below, this is markdown. So this is just a standard markdown syntax. I'm sure you guys are familiar with um, So this is an example of the YAML configuration. So on the left side is the system uh, YAML file, or the very top of the system YAML file. And it's just got some, some, some options set, or, you know, theme, or markdown extra. This is an override of the core one. So it's only setting a few. Uh, the thing on the right is what we call a blueprint. So this is also written in YAML, but this describes the form. So basically, this is the form for this system uh, YAML. So the form is used by the admin plugin, uh, but it lets you have a GUI to set the variables. You don't have to do it all by hand. Um, but a blueprint is quite powerful. It lets you define forms and fields and use it for our forms. Um, so a little bit of a demo. So here I'm going to basically do a little bit of uh, tweaking so you can kind of see things in action. Um, so we kind of already have a website here. I'll just use this link where I have one. And I'm going to open it up and do the studio code. I'm going to do this quite a bit small too. But, um, so I'm running on the main on my Apache server here. Oops. That one. I'm going to test that one. So this is Grab. So inside of here, is that readable? Yep. Uh, so this is the home page, and this is this this page here that we're looking at. And um, basically, the top is the title home, and then the body classes. Um, so I can actually do some overrides here. So I can actually say in the menu, show this as um, my home. So it hasn't changed the title of the page. But when I reload, it now says my home. But the title still says home. Um, and then I can remove that. But you just can start doing stuff. You know, this, this, this is what you do. Uh, for example, this is uh, 
both block, and then I can just have the, the, the best down code block. So I just, I just create a little code block up there. I mean, that's as easy as it is for, for writing stuff. Uh, and it's um, this has a, I'll turn on the debugger so you can see, but in the user config system YAML, oops, I'll put on, I'll turn on the debugger. And now I've got this debug bar on the bottom. And uh, I can see I can see stuff. So I can see here it's like 10 milliseconds to render this page. Uh, 2.1 megabytes of memory. And I can put the request and the timeline was taking what's what's slow. Uh, render assets taking two milliseconds. This is service side debugger. This is service side debugger. So one thing that we're doing, we're actually going to uh, in the next version of Grab, we're going to make it so that this debugger is more pluggable, and we're going to integrate with Clockwork. Have you ever seen Clockwork? It's a really sweet uh, debugger that uses a browser extension and uses AJAX to get the data um, with a JSON. So it doesn't impact the, the rendering of the page like the this, but this is just like a jQuery-based solution. So it kind of looks like a, like the developer tools in your browser, but it's not that specific like that. Uh, but this is quite extensible. It allows us to have uh, plugins. I can see what the plugin options are set to and things like that. And we've got these messages in here, so some things that are deprecated in this version, you can sort of read about those and, and know what to do. Um, but anyway, so there's that there's that topography page. It's there, and then um, if I want to add a new page, so adding a new page is a matter of saying I want this to be O3. Blah, and I want it to be 03 because I want it to come off and type on the B. And I'm going to create file for default that I'm B. And then you know, <coughs> I'll give it a title just to be polite. Um, and I think I can do. I'll put a Laura Mix in there. So that's all I did. And if I reload it, I've got a page. It shows up in the menu and my content is there. And then what's kind of cool is, let's see, I'm going to put this stuff. A lot of graph sites. I'll do, all right, so if I do this, I copy an image and I stick it in this blog folder. So there's an image there called Defender. If I want to include that, I can just use the markdown syntax and say uh, defender.jpg. And I don't have to put the full path or anything. Grab's going to know that it's there. So if I load it, now that's in there. Uh, but I can do cool stuff. I can say prompt zoom equals, say, uh, 800 by 200. And it's prompted. Oh yes, it's wrong. A little bit there, the thing is there. Um, and I think if I can do, I can do other stuff. I can do um, maybe like setting up. Now it's like setting. So there's a whole ton of stuff. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is all documented. This 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 learn site is all written inside of Grab too. You find something that, that you want to modify or fix. So this whole thing with the media, um, there's all of these functions you can do. See so all these resize, contrast, negative, edge. There's examples of what they are. But if you need to modify it, you can click on edit, go to GitHub, you make your edits, you'll do a pull request, we'll merge it in. So it's a very active uh, community there for, 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 for developing that stuff. Um, yeah, what else did I say I was going to do here? So I did. Uh, okay, so page link. You're asking about page link. So if I wanted to link to another page, um, I could, could say I could link here, like in the syntax for linking the markdown, the square brackets around what you want to link, and then the path. So it's almost similar to this, but there's no bag in front of the explanation point. So if I want to go to topography, I can just do dot dot topography. That'll go up a level and then into topography, or I could say, 
I know topography is at the root of my website, so I'm going to go to slash topography. So I'll just do that, and then, um, so when I'm there, and I click on that, go to topography. Um, but you can do more complicated things. You can go up and down, multiple levels, um, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so page linking, so we add some media, then a little bit of manipulation. So override header option, can I do that with the menu? Uh, custom header fields, use twig. Okay, so um, just to show you the, oops, just to show you the power of twig, I could put, I could put a, like a variable in here, say, um, I say colors, and I could do you know, red, blue, green, that's an array, and then I can turn on twig process, and I can say process, true, and then here I can say um, I'm going to do an H1 tag, right? But, um, I'll just do it with mock down. I'll do H1. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do that. Let's H1, and I'll do style equals color. And I'm going to use twig here and say page.header.colors I'm not sure, I might have to double check that one. Um, and I'm going to actually know what I'm going to do. I'm going to double, I'll just set a variable. Set color, and this is twig, twig language. Um, page.header.colors I'll use that variable. Color. Might not be random, so let's see if that works. Uh, okay, no more. Okay. Let's uh, let me turn off the caching. It's not random, so obviously it's something else. Let me just quickly check it. So the most popular plugin we have is the admin plugin. Um, I really didn't want to create an admin plugin for a long time, but it just got 
around it by the community to have something so they can um, use it for clients. So originally this was sort of intended to be for like developers or, or just developers that didn't mind working with the file system. Uh, but the admin plugin is obviously an important feature for a lot of people. Um, you know, try explaining to your you know, to your mother how to do her like meeting website and getting the file the system. Um, so that is probably the biggest and most complex plugin we have. Uh, but there are a whole other type of plugins. We have content plugins that are used to manipulate content. Um, there are obviously visual plugins that are using like JavaScript uh, to do things like slideshows. There's SEO uh, metadata plugins that help work automatically generate SEO uh, tags and uh, you know, all the open browser stuff. Uh, there are full, big, full blown plugins that do things like e commerce and galleries and uh, you know, things like that. Uh, there are plugins that extend other plugins. So, a good example of that is some shortcut plugins. They all extend shortcut core. Uh, there are plugins that just do CLI commands. So, they just some descriptions. And other API integration for looking at other services. Um, so, to install a plugin, you basically just drop it into the um, to the user folder. But a much easier way is to use GPM. So, you use bin GPM index to view a list of plugins, and then to install one is just bin GPM install and the slug of the plugin. And that will basically download it and unzip it. That's really what it's doing. And if you want to make a modification, um, kind of follow the, the grab rules of configuration where you take the configuration file that the plugin provides and you copy it um, to this user config plugin location and you modify it, or you just modify attributes to, to, that you want to modify. It's your choice. Um, so, this is kind of what the index looks like. You'll see a list of all these plugins available and what the slug is and their current version, and if it's installed or not, and what version you, you have installed. And you obviously, you can filter it. Now we've got you know, 300 minutes to install some music list. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so we also have a table and a, a, a stable and a testing um, release. So you can create a plugin, but you may not be ready for prime time, so you tag it and test it. So only people that have the testing option set will see that. Uh, but it's a good way to help your friend say, um, um, or your co workers. Um, Testing this to make sure you're on the testing uh, option for GPM. Uh, you'll see it. Um, so, just really quick with plugins. Um, I'll kind of show here what it's like in GPM. So, I can just say in GPM index. Uh, a little slow here. Getting the data the first time. So, should be faster the second time around. Um, so these are like plugins that are available, uh, and, and also themes. So there's a hundred free themes that are available now. So you install one. For example, we have on this site, um, in this homepage, we have a couple of code blocks here. But so I can install Bing GPM, install Highlight, which is Highlight JS plugin. And I didn't do anything other than just say install it. Oh, I actually checked something, which I always do. I installed it by a link because I have this plugin locally clone and Grab sees that, so it, it, it says, hey, you want to use your Simlink version rather than actually go and grab it from the repository. So I, uh, that's my feature, especially during development, because I have a whole bunch of plugins that I have cloned. In fact, I have every Grab plugin clone. And uh, it lets me, like, Debug those really easily um, because I can test them in different environments that will simulate back to the same clone. So if I make a change, I can, I can check it and then um, I can just make that, 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 that change back up to Git. And then, so now I just install that and I hit reload. And you can't really tell that first example, but this one has a little bit of syntax highlighting. Now, it's, now this is a different color from, from this. So that's what that plugin provides. And then if I wanted to, to save it, for example, to go into my editor here, I can just go config, and I'll just make a new file, and I call that plugins, and then click on play, click on plugins, highlight, 
So now it's in user config plugin values. And I can just here I can I can overwrite stuff. So how long to disable this one? To disable the false. So now I reload it. Um, oh he is. That's exactly right. It's um easy to make stupid mistakes and you spend a while working on what you did wrong. But um, uh, you do get used to it after a while. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how you kind of work with plugin. Um, I can show real quick what it's like to create a plugin too. It's, first of all, I have to install a plugin, um, plugin called DevTools. Then I just say big plugin, dev tools, new plugin, my plugin. So just to go and cover a little bit on the admin plugin, because this is what a lot of people care about. Uh, it's intended to provide uh, as much functionality as, as possible, but you, you still are going to have more control if you work with the files. But it's, the point was that you want to provide as much functionality that the user is needed without being overwhelming. Uh, so this is sort of what it looks like. Oh, it, uh, the one thing it, uh, some things that, that it does have is it lets you install plugins and things like that, but it doesn't allow you to modify themes. A lot of people ask, can you modify the themes? And then, no, we, we figured that's a developer job, not something that a user of the app can share licenses to. Uh, it does have an optional two factor authentication system built in to make it more secure. Um, one thing that we recommend is it's okay to use this for development and maybe even on staging, but on your production server, uh, you don't really need it. Probably set up staging so that there's 
uh, get close to to copy over your your changes to the live production server, but it's really no need to run the admin on the live production server, which obviously makes the entire website much more secure too. Um, so that's what the login looks like. This is a little song on the dashboard.
uploading something. Uh, that shows up in this page media section, so you can upload images just by dropping them off onto page media. And uh, you, can, you can actually drag this right onto the editor and then post the link to the page image there. So if I wanted to add another one, I just sort of drag it in, isolate those in there. like bigger. So uh, these are a lot of things that are available in the page headers, but you don't know about them unless you read the documentation. So in the admin, it sort of presents them to you in a more friendly way. So you can set a publish date, so you can say publish, but you can give it a date so that it publishes automatically in the future. You can give it metadata, so you can give tags and things like that. Uh, then in the advanced options, you can do a lot of overrides. So you can you know, change where it is, you can give it body classes, you can Take the menu of the slug, you can redirect from this page to another page, uh, you can control how it's cached, if it's routable or not. So like the routable thing is useful if you want to include this page in another page, but you never want someone to go directly to this page because it's like a little author block or something. So you can uh, do that kind of stuff. There's a very uh, a useful function called page inject. So you can basically create pages and then inject that page into other pages. So it's useful to put like an author or something. There's all kinds of logins like that. So that's sort of pages, and then uh, it's, it's plugins you have installed, and if you want to add a plugin, you go here and say, I want to install this to Mountain plugin, and uh, it's going to download and install it for you, and now it's installed, and then whatever this Mountain plugin is, you can put it in. And this is a community provided plugin, I don't even know what it does, but um, and he's, I think, like, this plugin has custom fields and, and options. So now that's available, I can just, I can just disable it there if I want to. Um, and then the themes, again, it's the same sort of thing. You can install themes. So all these themes are available, and you can install uh, the theme. And, um, the thing about Grab is that it's not like WordPress where any theme is going to work on your website. Because the theme is so in independent from the content, and all the templates that render your content are in the theme, uh, can sort of switch stuff, but if I if I were to uh, switch to this theme, um, it probably would run into problems on your website because this theme may not have the stuff that, that I'm expecting it to have, or like, like I said it has to have. So actually, if I just click like this, um, it renders, but it, it may not render the same way. So um, as this theme is okay, it, it works out fine, but it, but, the, but there's no guarantee. Because there's, um, for example, for our documentation website, that theme doesn't have a blog in it because it never needed to have a blog in it because it's for documentation. So if I have a blog and I switch to the documentation theme, it's going to say, hey, I don't have a template that renders your blog. Um, so that's kind of normal. That's kind of expected inside of Grab because you can really tailor your theme to what you're trying to do. Um, it's actually a really cool feature of Grab. So, some people have a problem with that because they're used to the WordPress world where you can write your content in the blog and then you can just start browsing themes and trying themes and see how it looks. Because uh, all have to sort of work with the standard stuff. But inside Grab, there's nothing from the standard. It's not saying you have to support it because you have to do that. You can do whatever you want. So that does mean that there is a bit more of a, of a tie in between how you, what kind of content you have and what you have. Um, I think I have to wait for it to stop. 
think like won't even go to the end. But Kino has this um, has this animation thing where you can make it slide like that, uh -huh. but it only goes to like uh, hundred like fifteen thousand pixels or something. So that's as far as that wide screenshot as possible. Then what a more big thing. Um, so as I alluded to before, the the twin template that is rendering the page uh, is directly related to the name of the file of the content. So if your file is called default.md, uh, it's going to look in your current name for a template called default.html. It's not there, it's going to throw an error. Um, but it uses Twig, which is a really fast templating engine that uses a lot of caching, so it doesn't, it's not, it's not uh, recompiling this stuff every time. Um, and all the Twig templates should be in the templates folder of the um, the theme should also contain, you know, all, all, all the standard things like fonts, CSS, images, etc. Uh, if it if it if it extends a, a base theme, it may not have all these. It'll just sort of reference the base theme, which is override, which is override. Um, there should be a blueprint file in there that contains at least the main theme of the author. But you can also put a form in there to define any custom fields that the theme may have, like if you want to set colors or a logo. Um, so, just to quickly show you what a theme looks like, I can show you Quark. Quark is the, is the new default theme. Uh, when it grab came out originally, they had another theme called Antimatter, and it was more of a basic theme. And I kept on getting requests for this added functionality, so I decided just to create a, a new theme uh, for that. So, under user themes, there's uh, Quark. Actually, that, that Afterburner 2 was one of the stories. But you can see an assets folder, then a blueprints folder. This contains the configuration files. So for example, default. Uh, this doesn't have much in it because it extends the built-in default blueprint. And it just extends this one, like it adds this one field, header body classes. So that's specific to my theme. I want it in every page. Um, so I can add that. Uh, then there's, there's a Blueprint for items, so this file defines a blog item, and there are custom fields on here. So there's a continue link option, there's a header image option, these are all some custom fields. You see, this is a type toggle, this is a type text. Uh, so this, the blueprint is purely for the admin, it defines the custom fields that your theme can handle. Uh, so obviously, CSS is where I'm dropping into CSS, and compiled CSS is where my SAS files are compiled into. SAS, and fonts, in images obviously, but you know, bad icon things, JavaScript, SCSS, and so this is what my SAS files, source files are for that. Uh, but really the meat of it is in this, um, in this templates folder. So this is where default.html twig is, this is the default file. There's not much in it because it extends this partial base. So if I go into partial base, this is where the, the main chunk of the, of the output is defined. So I'm setting some variables, I'm pulling out some theme variables and stuff like that. I'm setting an active language based on graphs capabilities. Um, I'm setting the title based on the page title. And, uh, there's some standard metadata that's getting pulled in, but then the, the link is the assets. So I'm using the, the assets manager to add CSS to the assets manager or the JavaScript. And then this is where the assets are rendered. CSS function. Um, and it is the, the base HTML in this section. So we go include just the, the mobile nav, um, any messages that are coming out of grab, and so now from here. You have complete control over all of this stuff, though. There's, there's no HTML coming out of grab at all. It's just, it's just data, and then you can decide how you want to work with that. Um, it has its pluses and its minuses. It just means that you get more control than you have to do. But you, you can reuse a lot of this stuff too. Like I uh, reuse a lot of this stuff theme to theme. I just, like I, if I'm doing a new theme, I normally just copy form, and then I start making a change. And there's a cool thing inside of this where I can actually do in, in uh, plugin dev, right place? Yeah. Uh, dev tools new theme. So just like I did for a new plugin, it's called my theme.
can say copy. So I can copy work. And it basically creates my theme by using work and renaming all the stuff inside of work. So now I've got a base theme that I can now I can now modify it freely and not worry about any updates overriding and stuff. So that's a really good way to, to create your own theme. You just take another theme, use so dev tools to copy it, and then you just start modifying. Um, and 
is like session store active defaults. So um, that's if we come back to the web page, it will remember what they would do wrong. Um, there we go. There's, there's quite a few options. But, uh, um, so on the pages, if you click on blog, you'll see how this is um, a root. We've got this, this sort of blog listing page in all of these languages. So there's not really much going on in here. They're all very similar, except for the fact that the title is different. So in German, the title is yeah, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's the sort of the um, the main listing page, and then for each of the blog posts, um, you would do your own language. So uh, this is Laura Mims and stuff, so it's not all about the kind of this one, but um, that's good enough. Get me started. So this is actually in a language and then in another language. So in the Greek here, it's it's uh, what is it? Greek? Greek? Yeah. Greek, yeah. Um, it's got you know the title is translated, the headline and everything like that. Um, so you can translate all of these header attributes as well, and they're just used. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility there. And I wanted to show you this in the admin. So do that, I'm going to install the app. Now I'm on the admin, and if I go to pages, you'll see that I'm in English, so there's a little en there. Then I can switch to um, you know, another language. And you can see uh, this all makes sense to you guys. Uh, <laughs> so there's not much in that one, but um, so this one is. So you, you can see it. The title is translated, it's not so I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Dutch, and I can easily switch to different languages from here. Right, so I can, I can quite easily translate this to uh, other languages. Um, if I didn't have a language, I would get a drop down on the save as. So I actually happen to have all of this translated in all the languages, but if I were to add another language, uh, could you guys think of another good language code? Still in, uh, in B, but then I can. Um, I don't have this page translated into PT, so I can save this as save as Portuguese. So now I can just start going through it, and I'm already able to see Portuguese. Is that even right? Um, so now I've, I've saved that in Portuguese. So now it's available in there. Um, if I switch to a different page, shows me the, 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 that I'm in the Portuguese language. I only have this one page translated because it's the only one that's purple. And all the other ones are falling back in English. So I have to go into EN and I have to you know, have to change this and translate this to be Portuguese. And let's save that and save as Portuguese. So now I go back, now I've translated that one. So you can kind of see what you've translated quite easily. Um, it's all, uh, it's all done, it's all possible to be out right here. So, some sort of takeaways here. Um, so, Grab is obviously um, a dynamic CMS, but it's award winning. Um, and we have the most stars of any PHP CMS on GitHub. I'm not joking, it's, it's true. Um, even even you know, beating out some of our bigger 
more money fed competitors uh, of a code of CMS and stuff like that. Um, so we have a very active community here and, and, and we've actually won this a People's Choice Award a couple of times. We got the best open source CMS in 2016, best flat file CMS in 2017. Have um, over 650,000 downloads through the Grab website. That doesn't count direct downloads to GitHub. It's sort of a uh, little tricky to get that data out. I know we have like maybe 50,000 installed through Composer. Uh, we've had 170 cool Grab releases. That doesn't count any of the admin plugin or any of those things, but Grab itself has 170 releases. We have a lot of releases, we usually release every two weeks or so. Um, Updates will manage to the CLI or the admin. So it's really easy to update. We can still update on the graph one point of the uh, It has over 11,000 stars on GitHub. We have a very active uh, Discord chat. And we also have the Discourse forum. I get those confused. But uh, Discord is the chat. Uh, we moved from Slack and Slack started crumbling under our uh, uh, load of users we had. But uh, Discord handles it in style. Also. Um, and then, if you want to get some more information on it, obviously the homepage is getgrab.org. And we have a forum, uh, we have documentation that's linkable right up to getgrab, or to learn on getgrab.org. We have a blog. With the Discord chat, you can join that by clicking on, uh, on the Discord icon on getgrab, or to chat on getgrab.org. GitHub or GetGrab slash grab, Twitter at GetGrab. We have a mailing list where we haven't really used it too much, but that's, the intention is that if there's a major security incident, we will use the mailing list later if you know so much as I know that. So we're very accessible, really easy to reach us and talk to us and participate and be a part of the community. It's a very good community. Um, so that's it. So if you have any questions, Running this project, so it's just I don't have a lot of time to do community sort of involvement stuff. Uh -huh. um, and so obviously, we don't have a marketing budget and things like that, so it's sort of word of mouth. We're just relying on our community that we have to sort of spread the word. Um, you know, there are companies in, in, in the Netherlands using it. Um, I was just at one of our clients. Um, Germany is quite popular. Could be just, there's just few people that are actively doing 
Yeah. Well, I think also, like, in, in, in Yoni, for example, it was featured in one of the print in magazines quite early on. Uh -huh. So uh, a lot of people heard about it early yeah. on, so that's why you why she feels Yeah. Did you write it? was like T, T, some, T3 or something? I don't know. T. Oh, uh, no, 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 I know it was a magazine with a red logo, it was very short, it was like one letter or two letter. Yeah, was a few years ago. Yeah. Someone sent me a, a scan of it, and then I didn't read it because I didn't photograph it. It's a scan. I know what it says. So we, we get a lot of people that are complaining about the PHP part? Or do we used to more. Like, why are you doing this in PHP? And why are you using you know, this JavaScript or Go? Or and uh, the main reason I did PHP, one, I've been using PHP a long time. Um, you know, I've been using more stuff and all that stuff. But, um, you know, PHP really uh, improved a lot. Like, PHP 4 was terrible. PHP 5 was bad, you know, starting in there. But then they skipped 6, the whole PHP 6 fiasco. And PHP 7 was like starting to get solved. Now, there's always works. Like, there's weird naming issues and function for some of them. They're not consistent. Uh -huh. But I don't want to hold that against it. Um, you just sort of learn those things. You know, expect to program in purity and how you work on But I came from a Java background. I did Java in college when Java wasn't even released yet. It was, it was a pre-beta. And I did my, my, my senior Final project in, in Java, my computer engineering degree, and uh, none of my professors even heard of it. Uh, this was a brand new language, it was so exciting. There wasn't any libraries for it, and I wrote an like, open source um, uh, uh, gaming protocol for like, you know, like, like doing uh, I did a tic tac toe game, you know, tic tac toe, lots of crosses. Um, with a game server, you could chat with your people, you could challenge your friends to play and that game, mm -hmm. but there was nothing. I had to write it. It was a whole a TCP protocol yeah. card. I was like, yeah. But, you know, that was in a pure language, but it had nothing available. Um, then, you know, but, you know, PHP is, is, is pretty good. Got a little bit of backlash at the start, but it's getting better and better and more powerful. So, so Rob's good a couple old pieces of yeah, so we, yeah, so basically, Brad is just like glue. You know, we're just gluing together, you know, a markdown parser with twig templating, with YAML configuration, doctrine cache, and some symphony framework stuff for handling things like process management, or some of these things. The, the image library that we use is not ours. Uh, if I had written all that, I don't know, it would take me 10 years to. But instead, I had a prototype of a grab up in less than a week from when I started. I had something to, to mark down and rendered it, had some preliminary caching in it and stuff. And then I started showing it to some of my friends, and they were like, oh, you know, and when's the beta coming out? Mm -hmm. I'd like to try that. So then I started trying to get it a little bit polished, and then people started using it, and then they started using the features and trying to balance it with the port, plug in, try to keep the core as minimal and as solid and just feature rich but not everything. Not the so since you use a preprint with the 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 render page taken out must be pretty pure because that's a comment I see now about the new WordPress five two one and that is that they use good their own classes and stuff like that. Uh, well, the thing is, is, is um, it doesn't actually output any HTML. Twig, Twig is, like, you put the HTML into it. Yeah. So you have complete control over what it outputs. All it does is it, is it, is it can do logic. Uh, did I show you any Twig? Not really. Kind of. Um, I did a little bit. So, uh, Twig is, uh, this, this thing is called so Twig is um, Twig is basically the, the curly brackets. It's like uh, like a mustache language. 
where it's a curly brackets and if it's got a curly parentheses, that's not an output. That's that's like a function or something happening. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's got two curly brackets, then that's output. So that's going to be output to the screen. So that's how you can output variables, the results of functions and stuff. And then mm -hmm. so so these sort of curly bracket with the with the um, percentage is used for like uh, blocks, but also logic. So if I go into uh, say the post um, say post list, there's a for loop. So for posting collection, include this. It's automatically going to pass in variables. So post is passed in, and then post item is using post. You know, so Twig basically provides um, you know function uh, functionality to HTML, so you can do logic. You know. um, but there's a lot of escaping, so it's you know, secure. So it's automatically escaping HTML. That's why. It, um, I think this thing might not be updated, but that's why you use like raw to say yes, it's okay, it's like safe to output the HTML. Otherwise, it would escape HTML, which is good for the security. But it's very but it's still readable. It's very transparent. Yeah, for like a designer, for example, uh, the Twig site's very good. They have Twig for designers and Twig for developers. So if you're a designer, you click on the Twig for designers, and it shows you the stuff you need to know to write this sort of Twig code to write HTML and then uh, Twig for developers is more like configuration and uh, optimization and like that. But you know a designer can like look at this and it's not too bad. It's HTML a web um, like it's HTML with a little bit of logic, whereas in WordPress, for example, they don't have a template anymore, so they just stick PHP right in here. And that can get gnarly, you know, it just can get really ugly and complicated. This forces you to Use logic in your presentation layer only when you need logic, and then anything complicated should be done maybe in a plugin to generate data and make that expose that data to the twig rather than doing all your logic inside of the twig, which is what a lot of people try and do. Try and say, no, 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 keep the keep the HTML and the twig clean, as clean as possible, because um, you know twig is very advanced, but it's not as sophisticated as a, as a person, so we can't go in and say, okay, I'm going to optimize this and make this a variable and make this a function and reuse it. If you put it in, in in this, it's just going to convert this into PHP, but it's not optimized. It's just doing its programmatic thing, just sort of converting it. It's cached and everything, but it's not the optimal way. It's better to leave the developer to 